Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 89, and today we'll talk about the need for common goals, transparency, and accountability, and uh, will we be living with endemic COVID from now on? Uh, starting off with, uh, I guess, some, you know, so, sort of sad news, and, and uh, I know Mike Zerubo went to medical school together and uh, worked with him, but uh, he basically, the article in the World Herald over the weekend was, uh, he got stuck having to call 23 hospitals to find a patient for him, for an ICU bed. He had to send the, his patient as far as uh, Des Moines. Maybe even worse, this was a friend of his. And so this is a horrible situation for a rural healthcare provider to be in, to be in the point where our hospitals are so full in Nebraska, we have to sit, literally ship sick people out of, out of state. Uh, and this just shouldn't be happening. Um, and it's getting really hard, I think, for a lot of healthcare professionals because they're going through this while at the same time the general public seems to be thinking, well, things are just fine. I'll just go around my very way on things. And so it's really causing, I think, a lot of challenges for the medical community to have to be in a situation like this where the general public doesn't seem to really be paying much attention to what's going on. Um, you know, the hospitals are full, and so what's happening right now, here's Douglas County's numbers. You can see that their numbers are going up, but their hospital capacity is kind of getting peaked here, so there's not much room left to go there. Uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, we're up to 93 people in the hospital. Uh, locally, the number of Lincoln people has flattened out. Hopefully that's partly in due to our mask ordinance put in place a few weeks ago. Uh, but the number of coming from out of town, well, I guess if we free up space from our local people, we can take more of these people from out of town. Uh, but our hospitals are at capacity right now. Uh, I think Brian's doing a great job still of putting out these visuals, uh, basically pointing out that, look, yes, there's a few people who are vaccinated that went in the hospital, but not very many, and pretty much all the sick people are all people not vaccinated. And so this, I think, hopefully conveys to people that, uh, one, the vaccines really do work and make a huge difference, especially when you consider most people are vaccinated. Uh, and also pointing out to people that a lot of these people in the sick in the hospital, they're young people. They're not just old folks. These are people uh, in their 20s, people in the prime of their life that are almost all unvaccinated. And so, yes, there's a, most of the people who are vaccinated in the hospital. They're older people with health conditions, whereas these, a lot of these are actually young, healthy people. Uh, and so this hopefully conveys the seriousness of the risk you're taking by not being vaccinated. Uh, Lincoln Public Schools, hopefully we'll find, uh, end up, uh, uh, the, the tests you know, are cumulative and the exclusions are cumulative over weeks. So we'll see at the end of the week how we're doing. Uh, we put the mask ordinance and requirement for K through 12 in place back here. Uh, the, the rate of increase uh, stopped, uh, well, it looks mostly stopped anyway. So hopefully we'll see that this levels out and starts decreasing now that everybody's wearing masks. And as more kids above uh, 12 and over get vaccinated. Um, so I've talked to folks across the state and one of the common uh, questions I hear is, but, but when will the mask come off? And I think it's important for us, and that's where I talk about common goals. We need to kind of set a common expectation, a goal about when the mask should come off also. Uh, I hate wearing a mask just as much as anybody, uh, but it's what we have to do to keep our community safe and those around us safe. But at, there, are, there are good metrics to shoot for, and I think we've had common metrics to be a little less resistance to putting them on in the first place. And so I've been throwing this around and I've asked a couple of the public health experts I trust most, uh, Ali Khan and James Lawler, kind of give me some input on this. Uh, and so I've kind of proposing again these metrics which I talked about last week, but with some refinements based on their input. Um, although one said, well, do we really need to have hospitals capacity on here? Because if we do the others, we won't have, we'll never hit hospital capacity. And I say, well, we got to leave it on because one, you can't hide hospital capacity. You're going to hear from the healthcare professionals when you hit that point. And that's also something tangible that people can see. This is a crisis when your hospitals are at capacity. So we shouldn't be taking the mask off uh, K through 12 in many uh, situations until our hospitals have some breathing room. Uh, and then uh, when, well, when we should have reduced community spread, that's probably the most important metric is how much is spreading around your community. Right now it's spreading around so much that it's just not a safe environment. Uh, we also might want to add uh, another sec secondary metric, one to 3% test positivity, that, that tells you whether you're testing enough. And the other thing is a building level, 85% building level vaccination rate, because this is about the herd immunity threshold for an R0 virus of six to eight, which is what we think coronavirus is uh, right now with Delta variant. And so this would be good metrics we could use to shoot for. And so looking at those in reverse order, you know, in Lincoln, we actually may have a few school buildings that are getting close to 85%. Uh, we have 63% of kids uh, 12 to 15 who's, who have initiated vaccination. So in a few more weeks and getting more people vaccinated, there may be some pockets where we actually are hitting that. And so I think that would be a good metric to shoot for and encourage people to hit that 85% vaccinated rate. Um, but low community thresholds of spread, we're just nowhere close to being there. We're still uh, up way up here in the red area uh, based on CDC criteria. There could be some leveling off here. We don't know for sure because we had uh, the, the holiday weekend. So we had three days of not the no reporting, delayed turnaround. We're gonna have to wait another week or so to see if this is a true leveling off. I hope it is because the mask ordinance put in place a couple weeks ago, you'd think you would take about two weeks to take to start seeing an effect. So this might be the sign that things are leveling off here in Lincoln. But we take the mask off when we get back down to here and we'll talk about how you might 
might set those thresholds a little bit. Uh, we've actually proposed that this blue line be the threshold where we were this summer when I wasn't wearing a mask again. And part of it's like I would say is are you a one, two, or three standard deviation kind of person? Uh, and this is a statistical term to say encompassing, you know, the range of possibilities. And the way I'd explain it to someone is if I'm, you know, playing a friendly game of poker with some guys, I might bet five or ten bucks. As soon as if I'm at the one standard deviation or if I've got better than 68% chance of being right, I'd bet ten bucks on that. Uh, now, would I go all in with that? That uh, chances probably not. But if I were at two standard deviation, which is about 95% chance of being right, I might go all in for poker. But I'm not going to bet my life on 95%. I want higher than that. So if it's my life or somebody else's, we want better degrees of certainty than than simply one or two. You want to go to this range. And so I'd say getting down to low would be this range. Although maybe politically we can't get there, but let's at least get to here, a low to moderate threshold before we say take masks off again. Uh, the other consideration, though, that I think is uh, that's gaining some traction, which I hope people start, start realizing, is COVID worse than influenza for children? The answer is yes, it is. Uh, now, this isn't what we thought. And literally, if you go back enough, far enough episodes, you'll hear me on these episodes and even at the school board saying at the time, we didn't think COVID was as bad as influenza for children. However, we have learned since January that that is no longer true. COVID is worse than influenza. So uh, with the uh, emergency youth authorization for the Pfizer vaccine, this was the data that was actually used, is initially it didn't look like coronavirus was e any worse than a bad influenza year. So the bad influenza here you're using as comparison is 2009 to 2010, which was the H1N1 pandemic last time. And for a while, it looked like COVID was tracking pretty close. But then uh, by the end of 2020, we saw the hospitalizations continue to go up and up and up. And so, no, it was it was worse than influenza. And we've known this uh, since about January. So these are weeks of the year. So this is the New Year's 2021 uh, numbering weeks as you go forward. So we knew based on hospitalizations alone already, it was worse than influenza. Uh, but now we're having fatality data. So if you go back to past uh, in pan influenza pandemics or seasonal flu uh, uh, epidemics, uh, usually deaths in children range from around 40 to 200 range, with the worst one being that H1N1 year, which ran for more than a year and got up to 358. Well, so far from coronavirus, if you add up these four buckets, because it's broken down by both age and gender, it's 470, and it's going up by 20, uh, 20 a week. And so we are, there are several hundred more deaths than even the worst uh, influenza season in the last 20 years. And this was despite the fact that a lot of kids stayed home, that most schools had masks, all the other things we did to keep it down still only kept it down to 470. So as we take all those breaks off, you're going to see the pediatric deaths uh, probably climb uh, in the 750 to 1,000 range, I'm betting, by the end of the year. So we know coronavirus is worse than influenza, and we have to take it more seriously than influenza. Uh, and you can see that in hospitalizations. So if you look at nationally, uh, even the worst surge, uh, the children zero to 17, we have more, uh, more kids in the hospital. And then the worst, and you can look at by region, if you go down to where still where the, the hot spot is the worst down here in the south, uh, there are three times as many kids in the hospital as, as there were in the worst of the surge. Even in our region, you're already seeing that the, that this is he heading up uh, to this way. Now, you have to keep in mind that, that one of the things that people forget, like I saw someone say that, well, we don't have to put masks on the kids yet because there's no kids in the hospitals yet. Well, the problem is the kids in the hospitals happen six weeks after the spread. So once uh, kids go to school with no mask, it'll take about two, three weeks for all those uh, coronaviruses to spread around everybody. And then the hospitalizations happen anywhere from one to six weeks later. You know, the acute things for influenza, like puts uh, like breathing problems, pneumonia happens within a week or so, but that, that multi-inflammatory system can take two, four, six weeks to show up. So this is a very much a lagging indicator. So you don't want to wait till people are hospitalized before you do something about coronavirus. So metrics for backing off, I'd kind of propose some of those. Uh, the other thing we might want to talk about is some differential masking, meaning some people get to take their masks off before others based on their vaccination status. We also have need to have adequate surveillance testing in place, which we still don't have. And so these are the things we should be working on right now, in my opinion. Uh, and part of the problem with the pandemic is just the bad communications. And like I've used in the past, this uh, astronaut Chris Hat Hatfield, the more you know, the less you fear. We need to know what's going on. And then people need to do a much better job of communicating. What do we know? Uh, what don't we know? What are we going to do about it? You know, the goals of psychology, describe what's happening, explain why we think it's happening, do our best to predict what might happen next based on what we've seen, and give people things that they can do to change and control things. So I think by the fact, for example, having a clear goal for us, hopefully that'll get people to start uh, coalescing around a real common source of action. Um, you know, one of the problems is, again, the lack of transparency and accountability. And you may have seen uh, the doctor or Governor Cuomo uh, being investigated for potentially hiding some deaths during uh, the nursing home scandal. And so some of these failures of transparency are bipartisan, both Democrat and Republican. 
Um, and the other thing is, is just being better about admitting the data you have and don't have. And I like this Colin Powell example in leadership where he talks about the 40-70 approach. And essentially, uh, we're in a crisis pandemic. We don't have complete information. So you have to make your decisions between 40 and 70%. You need to have enough information so you're not making just shooting from the hip, but you can't wait to have perfect information. Sometimes you're gonna have to make a decision and you might guess wrong. And I think a lot of our problems is, is on both sides. There's people who decided what they thought about pandemic and they're not revising their opinion as data comes through. And there's others who are waiting too long to make a decision. Like when, when should we put our mask back through K through 12? I think we waited too long for a lot of places and unfortunately still people are. Real leadership is making sure, understanding the best data you have right now, doing the, make the decision when you have good enough data, but also revising it when data has been proven to be wrong. Um, you know, one of our problems with making good decisions is a lack of data. So uh, weeks ago, the hospital association asked the governor to put the dashboard back in place. We need good data to make good decisions and hiding the data is the wrong thing to do. Uh, Nebraska is the only state in the country that doesn't have complete data. It's hard for anybody to really know what's going on, except for a couple counties. We cannot make decisions, good decisions, when we're hiding data. Uh, a bunch of physicians have written a letter to uh, Governor Ricketts and Antone to, one, uh, get us more access to testing supplies. And testing supplies are needed for a couple reasons. One is that, uh, one, we need to shorten the time to diagnosis. So, one, we can take people uh, out, isolate people so they don't infect others. Two, so we can get them antibody treatments because that could keep them out of the hospital. But the other thing is we can get people out of quarantine faster if we have better access to testing. And finally, get the dashboard back up. So here's a bunch of physicians all asking uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Antone and Ricketts to please put that dashboard back in place so we can see what's going on. Uh, more text on the data if you want to look, pause and read the whole text to the letter. Um, lastly, you know, is this going to be an endemic? And I think we lost our opportunity to, to contain coronavirus a year ago. We have to look forward to look at living with uh, uh, coronavirus in the future. Uh, one of the, my best sources of information, I like uh, your local epidemiologist from a public health standpoint, she puts the nicest, concise uh, uh, summaries together and the mu variant might be one of our next one. Uh, we don't know enough yet. It looks like unfortunately that it is uh, more likely to escape immunity and it might be more severe but it doesn't look to be as, as infectious as Delta right now. Uh, but the point though is that we're probably going to get other variants in the future. So is this the fourth out of seven surges or the fourth out, or is this our last surge? We actually don't know. It could, we could get lucky. Maybe this is our last surge uh, but I think there's a fairly decent chance we may be looking at another surge six months from now. So we got to learn how to live with this system. And so that's why we have those pan, uh, like those criteria for taking the masks off. We can use that to set in the future. When do we take them off? When do we put them back on again? We need a common metric and we need to start going by the evidence, but it's hard to go by the evidence when it's all being hidden from you. Uh, last source of information I think is very helpful to me again. Uh, from a clinical standpoint, I think these Daniel Griffin Twiv uh, podcasts are great to hear. Uh, this is my weekly Mowing the Lawn uh, podcast on Saturday mornings when they're released. And this kind of gives you, and they went through everything like the controversy over ivermectin. He went through the convalescent plasma, which unfortunately does not look like it panned out like we'd hoped. Talked about the disease in pregnant women. Well, yes, coronavirus is very severe for pregnant women, and you should get vaccinated if you're pregnant. Uh, and talks about some of the other things about uh, the antigen testing and things like that, where we could be making some progress. So if you want sort of like the weekly rundown of all the best studies, I would probably be going to him as, as my clinical and uh, your local epidemiologist as your public health source. Uh, so again, hopefully this update's helpful to you. Hopefully, at least in Lincoln, where we're going to see some leveling off of our numbers uh, over, the, over the coming weeks. Uh, we'll see what's happening. Uh, and again, hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, and this is, again, disclaimer. These are my opinions, not necessarily everybody uh, that I work with and for, but this is what I do for a living if you have any questions. And of course, healthylincoln.org is where you have the last episodes unless you just want to hit Bob Brown or YouTube and, and subscribe that way.